Welcome to We Are North Texas, a podcast brought to you by the University of North Texas system that focuses on innovation, compassion, ideas, and accomplishments in our home region of Dallas-Fort Worth. The UNT system is the only university system based in DFW and includes the University of North Texas, UNT Health Science Center, and UNT Dallas. With our heart in North Texas, we transform lives and create economic opportunity through education. Welcome to the We Are North Texas podcast. I'm Paul Corliss, Chief Communications Officer for the University of North Texas System. And I think uh, we have our uh, our local celebrity from the Health Science Center in Fort Worth, uh, Dr. Diana Cervantes, Assistant Professor and Director of UNT Health Science Center's Epidemiology Program. And if you're watching on video, she has an awesome mug. Dr. Cervantes, can you hold up the mug? It says, Dr. Microbe. A nice gift from some co-workers so i pre- you know, much appreciated that they gave it to me well i love it and and one of my favorite columnists in fort worth bud kennedy wrote a story on you recently talking about dr microbe how did that how did you get that nickname well it all started uh when i was working at the state health department and uh it was during ebola and we were you know we were exchanging private emails and all sorts of, you know, just our own emails so that we could keep track of each other. Sure. Um, and my email was Dr. Microbe and it, you know, another ending to it, but that was my email. And um, then it started becoming kind of a, a joke in the office and they'd be like, hey, Dr. Microbe. Uh, and then everything became Dr. Microbe. And I think also, you know, sometimes whenever you're going through a really stressful situation like Ebola was, as epidemiologists, we were doing a lot of what's going on right now with um, with coronavirus pandemic, doing a lot of contact tracing, you know, trying to really get a lot of people together, trying to understand what's going on during a stressful situation like that. I think if you have some, you know, some things to, you know, kind of lighten things up, it, it was helpful. So you when I left the, things a little bit, right? Right. Yeah. So when I left the state health department, um, they gave me this, you know, not nice mug of, you know, Dr. Microbe. And then it just kind of took off from that. And, you know, then my Twitter handle became, you know, at Dr. Microbe. And when I did that, my husband's like, I, I don't know, you, th- you think you're going to regret that later? I'm like, I don't think so. And so now it's now it's just at, at Dr. Microbe. So. No, you wear, wear the name well. Well, I, I was, um, you know, you and I had not ever uh, crossed paths in our work for the, for the university system, but um, I was first, I guess, introduced to you virtually when uh, when you went to UNT Dallas and, and helped with their town hall at the beginning of the, the COVID pandemic and uh, was really just so impressed by, um, you know, your, your knowledge and your ability to uh, present uh, complicated things in a manner that people understand. And I don't think I'm the only one that's that's had that opinion because you've really been out in the media and doing a lot of, of a lot of speaking and it's it's important for us to have voices that we can trust that are speaking in the media and speak in layperson's terms. How did you kind of develop your style of of being able to prevent or uh, present complicated subject matter in a way that 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 makes sense to people? All right. Well, thank you. That's a nice nice to hear. I think it really has a lot to do with the time I spent working as an epidemiologist at the county health department and of course in the state health department. Uh, I first became an epidemiologist, of course, before that I was a microbiologist. And uh, one thing that they were very, they wanted is as an epidemiologist, they wanted somebody who spoke Spanish uh, because you have to do a lot of case investigations and they really needed somebody who was a Spanish speaker. And when you do case investigations, so for example, right now in um, with COVID-19, epidemiologists are reaching out to people who tested positive to get information from them, but more importantly, to also give them information about the disease and how it spread. And so you just learn to make sure that you are explaining things Um, in a way that everyone can understand that's simple and also you want to make sure that people um, aren't scared because if they have a fear to what's going on to because they have a positive test um, they really can't remember their contacts it's hard for them to get information because all of these things are racing in their mind about what does this test result mean so it, it was, I think that was, that was very helpful in my career to just speaking to people, speaking 
um, to just everyday people about disease. Can you explain uh, the difference? What what is an epidemiologist? What is a microbiologist? What are what are the differences? Because you've you, you've talked to both, and both are in your credentials, and and I think our listeners would benefit by having a, a better understanding. So when you're a micro, so I worked as a public health microbiologist, and my job was really uh, a lot of testing. Like so, what you're seeing now, hearing about all of these tests that are run for coronavirus. So I developed some of those tests to try to identify those uh, organisms, so microbes, so it was either bacteria or viruses. Uh, So whenever you're a microbiologist, you really focus on the actual organisms, the microbes themselves. Uh, When you're an epidemiologist, you really focus more about the people that these microbes infect, because obviously the microbes don't spread by themselves, people are a huge factor in that. So that's really the difference. When you're working in public health practice as an epidemiologist, you're the great majority of your job is dealing with people and trying to explain things to them and giving them, giving them information, empowering them to make good decisions and so that they have the information to protect themselves. No, that, that, that makes sense. Um, I, I wanted to get a feel for what you know, what what does your job look like right now on a day-to-day basis and how does that compare to your job at the Health Science Center in air quote normal times? So another thing that I learned from working uh, at uh, public health uh, as an epidemiologist is you sort of get an outbreak mode. Uh, So that's basically whenever, you know, in early January, whenever, of course, everything was coming out with coronavirus, I, you know, I just I automatically slipped into outbreak mode, sure. trying to learn everything there was about the virus, what was going on. Uh, and so that still continues. That's just an ongoing process. So probably from the time I wake up till I go to bed, I'm trying to learn about what's what's new with coronavirus, what's going on. Um, what are people's thoughts about what is out there in the media? Uh, that's very important when you speak to people because it's not just about what scientists say, it's about how people digest that information. So. Uh, I do that a lot of the day, and of course, I do a lot of media interviews, um, which is great because I think it really helps get the word out there about what's going on. Um, So I do a lot of media. Of course, I still have classes. I teach infectious disease epidemiology. Uh, No surprise there. I teach that. And of course, I have interns who are, they're currently trying to work on their internship, wrapping that up. And I teach a public health practice class. So I'm still struggling doing a lot of um, you know, of course, mentoring students and teaching, uh, but also slipping into that outbreak mode of uh, go, what's going on with the, with coronavirus, um, what is happening. Also, I do um, I do some work for Tarrant County Public Health. Um, actually, what I, I before even coronavirus uh, happened, uh, I was working with Tarrant County Public Health in an organization called the Tarrant County Infection Prevention Council. And I chair that council, and it's basically a group of, uh, p- of people who work at hospitals, and their job is just infection, infection prevention. That's all they do. And we, earlier in, um, early this year, but also late last year, we really started focusing on nursing homes, doing outreach to nursing homes. So now that everything that's going on with coronavirus, that work continues. So I help um, Tarrant County Public Health really coordinate uh, calls and information with hospital infection preventionists, as we call those those people, and also nursing homes. So that's I've been doing that as well. And probably in a typical day, in a normal day, I still had a, a, all of those things, but just at a much smaller, reduced scale. So right, it's, it's, it says we in communication say we're in crisis mode, and you're in. <laughs> exactly, you're in it's crisis right? mode. It, it, so. I think it would be great to hear what is the latest, as you say, you follow the virus and what's going on in any you know new science breakthroughs. What's the latest as far as testing, as as far as treatments, as far as vaccines? What, what can you update us on as far as advances in the you know in the last several weeks? Uh, so many, so many interesting things have happened, and it's really I. Sometimes when I'm speaking to people and they're saying, well, it seems like we're so behind on testing and we're so behind on this, I always have to remind them, it's like we actually live in an incredible time where 
can happen. And although there's a lot more that needs to happen, there is a lot going on. So in regards to testing, even the testing that came out came out so quickly. Um, so now there's a lot of testing that is out as far as trying to test for the presence of the virus. So acute disease, whether or not you're currently infected with the virus. So a lot going on with that, trying to ramp up different type of test technologies so that uh, if you go to the provider, you go to your, to your just a regular clinic, they can do a quick test to determine if you do have COVID-19. So there's a lot going on with that. Um, and of course, there's a lot of pluses and minuses, a lot of drawbacks to that because tests are coming out so quickly. We really don't know how well they work. Um, they've done some testing, but not the highest level of testing because FDA has what is called an emergency use authorization saying, uh, we want you to put out tests, uh, test makers, um, but right now you don't have to follow the highest standards um, to give us a lot of validation information, but we want you to still roll them out. So there's a lot going on with that. Can I interrupt you with one yeah. one question about testing before you continue? Th there was a photo or maybe it was a video that went viral on social media of a, of a gentleman supposedly getting tested with a gigantic swab that, that seemed to go, gosh, about like four or five inches into his nostril. Is, is that really what, what the test entails? That uh, It looked painful. It looked scary. All right. Well, it should be a thin uh, nasal pharyngeal swab. It should be very thin. Uh, if it's a large swab. It's like a long Q-tip. <laughs> right. Probably the wrong type of swab. Uh, and that's why it's also with so, many, so much testing coming out, it's important to make sure that providers know this is how, you know, this is the best way to collect it collect these specimens because tests may be great, but tests don't work by themselves. You have to have, make sure the specimen was collected just right as well. So making sure that information is out there because yeah, it should be a very thin, it does go all the way back uh, to your nose, uh, to the very back, but, and it is not comfortable if you've ever had that, but it should be a thin, thin swell. <laughs> gotcha, so okay. anyway, back, the, the other updates I'd asked you about if there's anything new on the vaccine front or treatment front. There is, there is always ongoing uh, just things going on with, with vaccine and with treatment. We've learned a lot. Uh, physicians have learned a lot about uh, treatment. Uh, once people get hospitalized, what are some parameters that uh, really determine how, uh, how well a person is going to respond to certain treatments? Uh, there's, of course, a big breakthrough with remdesivir, uh, which is an antiviral, how well that works kind of back and forth on um, hydroxychloroquine. Is that a good thing? Um, so kind of back and forth. Same thing with um, with steroids. Uh, some people, so originally it was the idea like don't give steroids, corticosteroids. Now I think the idea is like, well, it depends on when you give them. So there's a lot that's being learned and a lot of trials are going on um, on these treatments. And I think more importantly, what's been learned is uh, you still have to go by good evidence-based medicine because I think uh, it's, and it's, I can only imagine, I'm not a physician, I can only imagine how hard it is for a physician if you're seeing so many of your patients and so many of them are so severe and they die that you want to throw everything at them, you know, let's try this, let's try right. this. But um, what they found is, of course, you still have to go, do good uh, trials because initially some of the treatments may have been more detrimental than beneficial to patients. So a lot going on with that. And then with that vaccine, of course, there's a lot of potential promises there. I was just listening to an, another podcast and they were talking about uh, a trial that's hopefully going to have in regards to oral, uh, to oral polio vaccine uh, mm -hmm. doing an overall coverage. So that's sort of interesting because um, right now, if you're going to develop a vaccine, you have to start with these different phases and, you know, trying it in animals and moving on. Uh, but of course, with oral, the oral polio vaccine, that's all of that kind of work's been done. So we'll see what happens with that. So there's just, there are almost every day, it seems like there are new things coming out. So maybe by the time this comes out, there's going to be even more. So it's, there, it, there are many, many interesting things coming out. Definitely gives us a lot of hope for the future uh, because scientists are just working on this all the time. And um, unfortunately, of course, with what happened in New York with so many cases, it's very tragic, but it's given everybody else a lot of information about the clinical course and how to really help people uh, once they get to the hospital. 
uh, improve on the, that clinical picture. Um, of course, a lot that's been found about even um, using anti, uh, anticoagulants. So a lot of interesting things. Yeah, have you ever seen a time where where the science community and the the medical community were were so laser focused on one issue? Has has that ever happened in your in your career? Have you ever seen anything like this? I think anytime there's a big public health issue, they are very you know laser focused. There uh, there are have always been and will always be uh, virologists that just focus on coronavirus. So this is their time. You know they're. Uh, they're excited about being able to do more with with what they focus on. Um, but of course, now with this being a pandemic, it is really uh, between this being a pandemic and of course, all of the all of the abilities to communicate with social media and all of these other avenues, um, there's so much more that I've, that I've ever seen. So even papers that are coming out, I mean, obviously, a lot of these papers haven't been peer reviewed, but there's still there's so in a way, they're getting Twitter peer reviewed because people are, you know, scientists are still re reviewing them and they're giving back their feedback as to, well, this is what I think these limitations and the benefits of this of this uh, paper were. So I think that that's a new element that I had not seen before. Yeah, I, I um, work with our chancellor on her social media and we, we found a group of scientists that, that we follow from all over the world that, that specialize in viruses. Who, who would you recommend are, are people that are, you know, that, that we should follow for, you know, for, for, for insightful news on, on social? Uh, well, my favorite podcast, and it's great to follow them on social media, is uh, TWIV. It's This Week in Virology. I okay. love the podcast. It is the best. It, you get the best information there. They break down all of the all the best papers that have come out and that, that podcast has been going on for years, but um, they've been having episodes, you know, at least one or two episodes a week and they bring in some of the best virologists and scientists oh, yeah, and, and physicians and epidemiologists. So that's a great page to follow. You talked about, um, you know, we were talking about your career a little bit. You've talked about your relationship with Tarrant County and, um, you know, you're at the Health Science Center in Fort Worth and, you guys have been, to, you know, at least from from a somewhat inside and somewhat outside view, so aligned and working well together. And HSC has has really stepped forward and and been a leader in Fort Worth and in Tarrant County. You know, with with Dr. Williams and yourself, and you know, just your testing center for first responders. Um, that seems to have been a deliberate effort to 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 make that happen. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, it's even when I was working at Tarrant County Public Health, there was a lot of uh, push to make sure that the health department had a good connection with the School of Public Health. And so there was always a good underlying connection. But I think with this, uh, with the, this event, of course, with coronavirus, it really exploded. It really took off because um, our, the university leadership was has really been very proactive from day one. How can we make sure that we are um, we're making sure that we're covering everything that needs to be covered, not just as a university, but really as the community? You know, how can we really serve our community as a whole and really partnering, strengthen, strengthening those partnerships with Tarrant County Public Health. Uh, um, making sure that, of course, we're helping them to, you know, really partnering with them to to help the community. So there's a lot of things that it's interesting because I'll I'll read about it. I'll read about it, an issue, and I'm like, oh, I wonder if the university can do something about that. Like the other day, you know, I was thinking about, you know, not not having enough of that testing media to do the tests, and I was like, I wonder if the university can do something. And then I see something come up that's like, oh, UNT Health Science Center is now going to make media for the testing. Uh, so the media is what you put the uh, swabs in. So uh -huh. then um, that's, you know, it's very important. So I was like, oh, I was like, oh, I just thought about this and boop, there it is. It's already happening. So it's, uh, it's been really exciting to see um, how proactive and how timely they've been with really addressing a lot of the gaps. I mean, they see the gap and it's like, how can we fill it? What can we do? And, you know, I'm really I'm really proud of our students, too, because they have really stepped up. And of course, I don't think they could have stepped up without the really good leadership, um, not just from faculty, but administration to really be able to say, OK, this is what you want to do. If you want to help, this is how we're going to give you the avenue to do that. So it's been really I've been really excited. I know when I left um, working in public health practice to be to work at the university, I thought, well, I wonder how that's you know, I still want to be involved in practice. 
how is that going to work out? Am I still going to be able to do that? And I think it's fair to say definitely still <laughs> still able to yeah. do that. So. No, it, it's a tremendous opportunity for students to, to get training like this. I mean, this is a, you know, once in a generation pandemic. Well, let's hope it's once in a generation. Um, that experience has to be really phenomenal to take with you when you move into your career, isn't it? Oh, definitely. It is priceless. You get to see what happens in the real world and how to really solve those real world problems that you face whenever you are out in the field. So um, whenever I teach my classes, I try to kind of mimic these type of situations. Uh, but this is the actual real deal. And it is, it is definitely a baptism by fire, but uh, they're doing great. And um, I'm really proud of them. Uh, we, are, we are too. Uh, I, I had to I wanted to jump into your past a little bit. You had a fascinating career I've, I've been reading up on, and you worked in bio, bioterrorism response. Can you can you explain what that is? Yeah, so uh, whenever, of course, after 9-11 and after the anthrax letters, um, you know, I, I feel like I date myself when I say that because my students are like, I don't, you know, I was a baby. Um, but... Uh, when that happened, of course, public health started getting a lot more money. Um, and so there were a lot more positions, much as like my students are, are seeing right now. So there are a lot of positions. And so um, I, my background was actually doing research in molecular virology. But I really wanted to do something that was more practice based. It was working you know, with the public. And so uh, a, a position opened up that was a public microbiologist. And the job was really to set up a group of laboratories throughout the state that were just going to focus on emerging diseases and potential agents of bioterrorism. And so at that time, uh, you know, one of the big things was anthrax letters, sending, you know, letters out in the mail that, you know, had powder. So we would, you know, we had to set up the lab because it had to be a specific safety level. So it's a biosafety level three. We, I set up that lab for Tarrant County Public Health. Uh, set up some protocols so that we were following national standards on on doing that type of testing. But it was doing a lot of environmental testing on you know people that would send threats, unfortunately, through the mail that had um, powders. It, it, it turned out to be nothing, of course, uh, most of the time. You had to um, check, right? Yeah. Right, but there were definitely times that um, there were uh, questionable things that came through the mail and. And there were, but more importantly, I think with bioterrorism, it was a focus too on um, emerging agents. So whenever that lab was set up, it wasn't just a focus on those potential bioterrorism, but the emerging agents. And it was um, at that time, that was before West Nile hit um, Texas, the United States and Texas. So being able to quickly set up testing to be able to test mosquitoes for West Nile and other, you know, types of viruses. That's something we were able to do quickly in that lab. So we were we started that testing in that lab. So it's it was really about um, understanding, you know, of course, things that could be used as potential agents of bioterrorism like anthrax, uh, but also those things that are are natural threats uh, from you know from Mother Nature. So um, of course, as I mentioned, West Nile. Um, we saw a lot of uh, cases of, you know, exotic, I would say somewhat exotic diseases like brucella so that some people, for example, that would eat, uh, eat products outside of the, of the United States that may have cont been contaminated, being able to test for those things that are more rare. So whenever you set up a lab like that, you have the capability to do testing for very rare organisms. So uh, that's really what the, what the work was about. It was really, it was really interesting. And, and, and that work, is, is that an ongoing in, in the county level or where where's the focal points of that? Is it federal that focuses on that or is it just in, in many different levels? I'm just curious, of, you know, how that how that works. It's a fascinating field. Right. So it's definitely it start, it's like anything in public health. There's at the federal level, there's the state level, there's the local level. And so I worked at the county level and there's still so at the Tarrant County Public Health Department, there is still in their lab is still the. A bioterrorism uh, response and emerging agents lab. It's 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 headed by, of course, another person, and uh, so that that work continues. And they're the people who are uh, doing in public health labs. They're doing all the coronavirus testing for the labs. So uh, for the public health labs. So their 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 job is still the same, uh, focusing on those emerging agents. 
Uh, so so interesting. Well, uh, last last questions I have for you. We'll go back to talking about coronavirus again. And what do you think the next three to six months look like? And and even the next year. What what do you where do you think we're headed? There's there's you know obviously lots of things I guess relayed on some of the new developments we're talking about. But best guess, what would you think the next three to six months look like, and then a year? Yeah, it's you know such a surreal time right now. You know, you think that this isn't it's it so it doesn't feel like this is real reality. But I can definitely see in the next uh, few months, maybe things will come down a little bit with the virus. A little bit, it won't be as bad because of the weather. I'm hoping, but of course, a big factor in that is how people interact with each other. Uh, so it doesn't matter how great the weather is. If people uh, have really close interactions, that's just going to spread the virus. So um, unfortunately, I think that we might see another wave. Hopefully it won't be as bad. I don't know if it's going to happen in the summer or more in the fall. Um, I think our I think this is going to be the new norm for a while where we're doing a lot more um, a lot more things via electronic platforms like we are right now, uh, classes that are going to be online. Um, it's just going to be something that we're going to be doing for a while. Um, but I think we should also think about the positives that if let's say this had happened even five or 10 years ago, there's no way we would have been able to do this. So at least we do have these platforms to be able to you know, have this kind of our new norm of doing more virtually. Um, so I think that this is just uh, the way things are going to be. And I think that also uh, it needs to be the new norm in people's mind that we're going to have to be very conscious of washing our hands, uh, being sure that we're keeping that social distancing, covering our noses and our mouths. If we go out to a place where we can't keep that social distancing, that's just going to become part of our everyday lives for a good while. Um, and I know it's it's really tough for people, especially people who are you know maybe extroverted and they want to go out and see other people. Um, but it's definitely in order to really keep that those case count down, we have to do our very best to try to keep that social distancing and keep that distance. And it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out with kids because as adults, I think we can do it. For children, it's it's another story. It's a little more difficult for them. Um, but we're just going to have to sort of take it a day by day, but know that these kind of these foundational things of working virtually, living virtually, social distancing is always going to be now in the background, along with those, you know, increased hygiene um, measures. Yeah, it's amazing how how quickly things have have evolved here. Well, you know, thank you so much for joining us. Last question I'll ask you is what, what's been the most interesting media uh, appearance you've done talking about coronavirus over the last several weeks? Um, they've all been, you know, they've all been really uh, interesting. I enjoyed them all. Um, I think probably the scariest for me was uh, going to, uh, I went to do an interview uh, with Telemundo and, you know, whenever, so when I worked at the health department, I primarily spoke Spanish. <clears throat> And so I know I was speaking a lot of Spanish because I was dreaming in Spanish. Um, but now I speak Spanish mainly at home with my with my family. And so I have to now get in Spanish mode if I'm going to really speak about something in Spanish. So, you know, I was trying to prepare myself, get in Spanish mode. I felt like I was I was good. I go and I thought it was going to be like other live interviews where you're sitting with somebody and speaking to them and they just happen to be filming you. But I went and there was like just these uh, little pieces of tape on the floor. I went and they're like, okay, you're gonna stand here. You're gonna put this in your ear. You're, no, you're not gonna be able to see anybody, but you're gonna have to look at the teleprompter. You're gonna read the questions, but there's a delay. Um, well, how daunting. So, yeah, I was like, what? They're like, and they're like, they're like and you know, like, what, what? <laughs> so that was a little scary. That was a little scary, but. Uh, I asked, my mom watched it in Spanish. She said I did I did okay. So, but that was so that was a little that threw me off because I think usually when you go, especially when you're doing um, when they're taping you, they're they're getting a video of you. They try to make it seem very you know natural, like a conversation, um, so that you don't feel nervous. And that's always that makes it so easy. Or they you know they're you know you're talking to a person, 
But whenever you're doing, like I've never had that experience of, oh, I'm looking at the teleprompter, hearing the questions, hearing what's going on in the background in the news. It was definitely tough. <laughs> well, in, in, in English or Spanish, we, we appreciate you being a, a source of accurate information and you make all of us in UNT world proud. Dr. Diana Cervantes, Dr. Microbe, follow her on Twitter at Dr. Microbe. We appreciate you coming on the show with us. Well, thank thanks you for listening. Me. Uh, thanks for coming and, and everybody that's listening. Thanks for listening to the We Are North Texas podcast. I'm Paul Corliss and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much. UNT World is a special place filled with talented and dedicated students, faculty, and staff that do amazing things every day. With our heart in North Texas, we transform lives and create economic opportunity through education. We are North Texas. I'm Paul Corliss. Talk to you soon.